very happy to be here. I want to start by doing two things. Uh, first of all, to say that I am so glad that I did not get a gift after this Mass. Yesterday, they gave me a very beautiful T-shirt, uh, which will remind me of this parish. I mentioned yesterday that when they spoke about St. Francis and about the, his, his wolf, I thought I was going to get the wolf. I didn't get it, and I thought then, oh, they're waiting for Sunday to give me the wolf. <laughs> but, and I looked outside here, you see this picture of St. Francis chatting with the wolf, and uh, the wolf seems to be listening very carefully. I'm not sure I would have that same luck, so I'm just as glad that Father Mark, you did not give me a wolf today. Uh, but you gave me all these nice people, and that's, that's so much better. Uh, I also wanted to say something about this course. Some of the folks have been looking at my, the course that I wear. It's for those of you who can't see it, it's missing half a leg. And it was given to me by the bishops of Cambodia about four years ago. They said, well, if you'll wear it, we'll give it to you. So I, I wear it actually every, I wear it every day for the last five years, four years. And uh, it, it, it's missing half a leg, partly because we remember St. Paul says that uh, our own sufferings are added to the sufferings of Christ. So we, we, have to, we have to think when we suffer, as we think we do sometimes, sometimes really, but sometimes we, we think we suffer more than we do. And uh, it's to say, okay, Lord, I'm doing it because you, I want to be that close to you. And then secondly, because in Cambodia, they had this terrible dictator who planted landmines all over the country. And this is the memorial of the landmines. Uh, in, in Cambodia, the landmines were not placed to, to God. The landmines were not placed to God uh, fortresses or airports or anything like that that people wouldn't come in. They were placed there to kill people. That was the reason. And uh, because of that, you now walk through the streets of Phnom Penh, the, the capital of Cambodia, and every seventh or eighth person is missing a leg or an arm because the landmines are still there. And especially children, because even though you put up a red wire saying don't, don't go into this area, children may play with a ball and the ball goes over and they go after it and, and they don't come back the same way they went over. So it's the sadness of war and the sadness of sin the sadness of people hating each other or not appreciating each other. And maybe that's the basic part of what I want to say today. Uh, someone asked me if I am a Republican or a Democrat, and I didn't hesitate for a moment. I said, I am both. I think that's the only answer. Because, dear brothers and sisters, in today's world, there's nobody totally 100% on our side. You know, someone who's on our side for this, they're not on our side for that. And so it goes back and forth. So we, we pray that, that what we teach is only what the Lord Jesus asks us to teach. And that uh, we try to get everybody to buy the whole message, not just part of it, the whole message. And this, this is why there are differences of opinion among us, because some of us put uh, a great emphasis on, on one part, others on the other part. And they're all important. Some may be more important than others, but the whole, the whole world of the, of what Jesus Christ teaches us, the whole gospel. There's no, I don't know of any group that totally buys the whole gospel. You know, you can buy the the obviously so important part, which is life, and 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 forget about the poor. You can take care of the poor and not those who are the poorest of the poor, the unborn child in his mother's womb. So this is, you know, we, we go back and forth trying to figure out where we ought to be, and the only place we ought to be is with the gospel. So we take the gospel and, and, and follow that. Years ago, I said to a, uh, a group of, of ministers, lay, lay and, and religious, who were striving for justice in the world, and I said then, as I, as I want to say now, so you know where I come from, uh, you cannot be an authentic Catholic 
if you are not pro-life. You cannot be an authentic Catholic if you are not pro-life. But the second part of it is that being pro-life alone does not make you an authentic Catholic because you, 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 you have to look at human life and dignity and all those things. And that's really the entrance to what I'm saying today when we talk about, uh, about immigration. This is not, I'm not talking about political issues, I'm talking about church issues, about theological issues. The bishops of the United States have come out very strongly for a, a revision of our immigration policies and for, for many reasons. But the basic reason of all is that we believe in the dignity of the human person. And anything that, that takes away from the dignity of the human person it takes away from the gospel. Because the gospel teaches us that we are all brothers and sisters in God's one human family. And that we are all equal in the love of God. And we should be equal in the love of each other. Now, it's easier to be in love with God than to be in love with each other. I know that. Uh, even in families, it's, there are some of us who aren't as say, lovable as others are. But like, you know, God, God gives us that. That's one of the challenges that he gives us in our life. But the, the greatest thing that we, that we believe in, that we accept, and that we follow is that God has made us all in his image and likeness, and therefore we have an enormous responsibility for each other, whether we like it or not. You know, we, we, we can't say, oh, today I'm gonna like this kind of people, and tomorrow I'm gonna like the other, you can't do that. You know, we gotta like, we gotta love all the people all the time. Not easy, not easy. But when you think that Jesus loves us, how hard that was. Because we know, you know all, the, all the stupid, dumb things that we do. I talk about myself. And yet Jesus loves me with a love so great that he went on the cross just for me. And just for you. And for each one of us. That's an extraordinary love. He's almost, we don't, we going to say he's almost blind to our defects, and yet we know he's not. We know he loves us and understands us better than anybody else ever can. And yet he continues to love us. To love us so much that he died for us. So I, I, with, with that, see, I want to put that to the basis because this is not going to be a political talk, but it's going to be a, a hopefully a spiritual talk that, that we who are Catholics, we who are faithful Christians may say, you know, this is why, this is why I believe what I do. Uh, the, the church has, or the bishops of the church have come out uh, a number of times for, uh, uh, for a reform of the uh, immigration system in our country. Uh, there are a number of, of things that, 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 that annoy us, that, that bother us. Uh, and I'm going to give you some of them. I'm going to give you all because we have to have you out by four, as I said earlier. So. But uh, num number one, because it, it can destroy families. You know, and, and I've seen in my own priesthood, I've seen families broken up because they, uh, they, uh, the mother was, was, was born here and the father was not. And, and suddenly you know, this family unit, which is so important to bring kids up, suddenly it's broken with one of the parents taken away and, and sometimes taken away brusquely. And I'm not blaming any of the law, import, law enforcement agencies, but sometimes it's the end of a day or something and they, or the, the person about to be taken away says something that he or she should not have said and the law enforcement officer gets mad and then something happens. But uh, to break up families is always something that we we are unhappy about them, so that's the first thing. That when, when a law breaks up families, uh, then it, uh, it has to be very, very carefully looked at because that is a very, very awesome thing that you are doing. And, and secondly, uh, it, it tends to make people less than they ought to be. And we tend to look at, we, we say people are illegal. I don't think people can be illegal. People can be undocumented, yeah, we know that. But to say, that, no, that man's an illegal, that woman is illegal, I think that's a, uh, 
it's bad te- terminology, but it's terminology that is, that is fostered by a legal system. And that legal system is, a, is, is hard for us who are Christians who truly believe in the dignity of the human person. And so uh, what is happening now, and then also what's happening now is that someone can be in, this, in the country, maybe they made a mistake when they came, that's quite possible. I'm not saying that's never happened, that's quite possible. They may be foolish, they may have been uh, dodging the, the law, they may have been doing something that was uh, against the law. But you know, if, if we were not like the Lord and never forgave anybody anything, we would really be in terrible shape. And so, you know, someone who, who after they made a mistake, corrects that mistake by becoming a good citizen, by becoming a, a member of our society uh, who, is, who is contributing, uh, who is uh, giving good example, who is raising a family. Uh, you know, that, that person, we say about that person that they are, that they are bad, they should be thrown out. Uh, I think that's, uh, that, that's, that's another point that we have to look at and have to look at it very carefully because is that how God wants us to look at each other? And then, there is, in some legislation, the opportunity for a person to become a a citizen. And others say, no, that should never happen because our relatives, our fathers came in and nobody, they they did all the right things. It was hard for them, why should we make it easier for other people? Well, I think there, the difficulty is that if, if you are going to make two classes of people, you're going to go back into the old days uh, of, of, uh, of two societies. And you know, there are, around the world today, there are many countries that have two societies. Some people can do something, some people can't. We saw that in Ireland at one time. And both sides were at fault. I'm saying that right from the start, both sides were at fault. But whenever there is somebody who is less than somebody else, somebody you look down on, oh, he's not a citizen, she's not a citizen, they can't vote, uh, they can't uh, apply for this or apply for that. Whenever you do that, you, you, you make a division in your society that is always bad. We, we've, we've learned that from the days. Here in the South, we've learned it. You know, I, I'm a Virginian originally, so I can speak because a southerner, and we've learned from the South the, the, the foolishness and, the, and, and the, the danger of trying to have a, a society, one society with two different grades of people. We see it in North Korea today, we see it in China today, we see it in some of the Arab countries where being a Christian means that you don't have all your rights. And if, if, if we who are supposed to give the good example to the world of promoting this, then, then we're, we're losing our ability to call for real democracy in the, in the world. So I think that that is a, a very important point for us to look at. The breaking up of families, the, 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 uh, the denigrating of some people, to put, put some people down, that they are not as good as others or something like that, is, is always dangerous. That's not what the Lord Jesus gave us. He gave us a family, you know, and he loved everybody. He, uh, you know, they, the, the Samaritans were not his friends, and yet uh, he, he goes to them with the same kind of love that he goes to the people of Israel, and loves them and works for them and works miracles there, and, and makes it clear that they are beloved by God. And so everybody is that. So that, that's really, you know, the, uh, the, the different uh, questions that are brought up, and we can't afford this, some people say. Well, I was reading the uh, Congressional Budget Office, which is a nonpartisan office in Washington, come up with a, with a study of what, uh, of what that one law would take. I'm not saying that's the perfect law, it is not. And I'm not saying that that's the law that we are after, it's not. We're trying to, to make that law better than it is now. But uh, it, all, all these things combined there make us want to say, 
hey, wait a minute, uh, is this going to bankrupt our country? And these, this nonpartisan group tells us no. This nonpartisan, I, I left my, my notes over at, the, over at the house because I spoke too long during the 12 o'clock mass. And I apologize for all those who were there because you must be hungry as anything now. Uh, but uh, anyway, I, uh, uh, this, this very important report uh, seems to indicate that that is not the case. That there that there will be uh, there will be finan there would be financial advantages in uh, reforming the uh, the uh, immigration lawful law system in the United States today, and that of course is important for all of us because we, we know that our budget has gone crazy and we don't want to look for something that's going to make our budget even crazier than it is now. So all those things are, are part of, of what we need. But uh, about five years ago, we, we tried to do this, for, no, maybe seven now. We tried to do it. I was still Archbishop in Washington, and so they asked me to help. So I did. You know, I spoke to all my friends and my enemies on Capitol Hill. And uh, I remember an, an extraordinary moment, one of the moments that you never forget in your life. And so uh, I could tell you the story. They said, there's going to be a big rally in the mall where you speak. And you know, I, I, you know, you don't want to have to write something and you know, see if it's the right thing to say or say the wrong thing and get everybody mad at you. So I hesitated and I finally said yes. And I spoke and some senators spoke and I got up at the end. And I never forget, I, the, the, the picture was in, of all places, the New York Times, which is not always our, our uh, gospel, let's say. Uh, but it was on the front page of the New York Times, the back of my head, and there were like a half a million people out there with American flags, and they were all immigrants. And they were all in this country for many years, and they all wanted to be here legally. And I, I remember looking at them, and looking at their faces, they were old and young, and you know, of every shade of complexion, uh, of every age, you know, kids and babies in arms, and, and old people in wheelchairs. And, and they were God's people. And they were, they were there because, and some of them were very hard because they, they were in stretches, or not stretches, they were in wheelchairs and had to be wheeled in. And, uh, and there was a, it was a November day, as I remember, so it was chilly. And I remember watching them as I spoke and, uh, and, and almost hearing the Lord say, help these people, help these people. And I, I remember speaking later to a, uh, at a press conference and uh, the people, the newspaper people were very tough. And they were saying, oh, this is impossible, you're never gonna happen, they, you know how they go on. And, uh, and finally, at the end, I, uh, I had to get out, so I had to say something that was like a sort of terminal. And they said, uh, how can you stand there and, and, and uh, think that, uh, that you can make a difference, that, that, uh, that this is going to happen? And I said, well, you know, I keep some yard. We have to dream. You know, we can't stop dreaming. And those people can't stop dreaming. And the more we help them not to stop dreaming, the more we help them to be the, the best kind of people our society needs today. Uh, there are, out of that community, there will be priests. Now, the, uh, the, say if you talk about the, the Filipino community and the, the Asiatic community, uh, which are a good part of this group of people who are, uh, who are uh, undocumented, uh, you know, we, we, the vocations we're getting out of those communities are extraordinary. Uh, and of course, there are many, many, many from our Hispanic brothers and sisters. Uh, and they, they have come. You know, I, I, I don't want to offend you by this, but I think it's true. Uh, I, I've, I've worked, I, I worked in Harlem. I was vicar of Harlem in New York. Then somewhat after that, I was in New Jersey, which is a, which is filled with uh, 
uh, with, uh, un, with people who are not born in the United States, New Jersey almost maybe more than most of the states. Uh, and and my, my contact with those people there was for me an extraordinary gift because I could see a, 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 a wonderful willingness to be part of this country to build it up. Now, they, none of these people talk down America. Sometimes we do. But none of these people talk down America. They're so anxious to be part of it. They're so anxious to, to grow in it. They're so anxious to be uh, what, what, what they hope that now they have an opportunity to be. And so the bishops of the United States have been very, very positive and very, very thoughtful and, and very, very prudent about all these things. Uh, there's a line that I was going to quote <coughs> from the Holy Father, from Pope Francis, who, as you know, is like a true Franciscan, you know, so dedicated to the poor and to those who, to the, to the have-nots, and to those who are, who are without a lot of things, without rights, without security, without family, all those things. And so, uh, I, I, I think of, uh, of, of Francis, I think of our Holy Father, and he has spoken so strongly in favor, not just of the poor who don't have money, but the poor who don't have rights, and the poor who don't have housing, and the poor who don't have safety, and the poor who don't have education, and the poor who don't have life. Now all these things are gradations of, of this extraordinary gift that God gave us and that he wants to give all his children that, they, that we all be able with all the powers that he gives us to use them for ourselves that we may become holy people for our families that we may have happy families for our country that we may have a just and fit society and that it may grow. So that's really the basis of all these things. And the Pope says, was to talk to some group of ambassadors, and not, not American ambassadors, but others. And he was saying to them how, how important it is that, that nations avoid being unjust to each other, to their own people. You know, we see this can happen. You all have seen this can happen. But in this area especially, that we, we should not, never have this country of ours unjust and in a, in a, in a program of uh, immigration today that is broken, everybody realizes it's broken and has to be fixed. And this, these are ways in which we, 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 we know we try to fix it. And the, uh, the, the, the bishops themselves uh, may not be totally agreed on the methodology, but all of us, I think, without exception, are agreed that somehow this has to be done. And there is, there is movement now in Congress, there's movement, the Senate has moved, we wait for the House to move. Not necessarily that we are 100% in favor of what the Senate did. It has weaknesses, absolutely. But what the House seems to be proclaiming is also has weaknesses. So we've, we've really got to get them to work together and to have a vision of, of, of what it means to, to work together. Uh, if there's anything, I used to like to think, if there's anything that should bring uh, the House and Senate together, that should bring the parties together, uh, it, it, it would be something like this. Uh, to bring to bring millions of, of our fellow Americans, because that's what they are. They don't think of themselves as, as uh, Chinese or as Filipinos or as Mexicans. They think of themselves as Americans. To bring our fellow Americans able to participate fully in the life of our country. Now, how we do this, well, we can have some. We can have differences of opinion on that. And uh, I remember talking on the Hill to, uh, to, to senators, one of says a good friend of mine, I won't tell you his name because I, it's easier to, you know, I, I wouldn't want to put him in his bad position, but he, uh, he was, was wanted, wanted, to, wanted to have a, uh, 
a position, an amendment to the Senate bill that would especially uh, invite uh, gay couples to participate in this. And uh, the listening to, to, to others, I could see that that would, be a, that would be a killer, what they call a killer amendment. You know, you, in, the, in, the, in the Congress, there are some amendments that people put in it's looking like they're in favor, but they're, they're killer amendments. They know that they put that in, the whole thing will go out. And but he, that was not his mind. He was just in his in the, in the state that he represented. Uh, this was allowed. And he said to me, he said, Father, he said, you know, I, I, I'm not necessarily in favor of this myself, but the citizens that I represent, they voted for this, and so I feel that I, I have to really support it. So I said to him, I said, I said, okay, I understand now, I'm glad you made this clear, but my fear is that you put this in, it will kill it, it will kill the, the legislation. And he, it was on the phone, he said, on the phone, he said to me, he said, you know, let me say this to you, if I think it will kill the legislation, I won't do it. I thought that was, that was good. I said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna act on your word, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that I spoke to you, and he said, okay, so we made a deal. And I, I spoke to uh, the leaders of the Senate uh, about it, and, uh, and you know, one said, now if it has that in, we're not voting for it. And uh, I said, but if it isn't in, he said, well, if it isn't in, then, then it'll be free. Anybody can do what they want. Uh, and uh, uh, one said to me, Senator X, he's the problem. He's gonna put that in. And then what he said, no, McCarrick spoke to him and he said he wouldn't. So, you know, what, what a blessing that you know, would be. Because he was apparently saying that to his, his other senators. He's saying, look, I'm going to do this because I have to do it, but I'm not going to kill the bill, I promise I'll pull it out. And that's exactly what he did. And so what a blessing. Because you, so, and, and that happens not because I'm eloquent, I'm not. It happens because people are praying like you, that it works. That's the power of prayer. That's only the only thing that changes people's minds. I'm convinced that you can't talk anybody into something or out of something. Only grace can do that. And so you got to pray for all of us who, who work there. I, I, I saw the speaker about uh, a couple of months ago, you know, and he said, told me exactly what he was going to do. I said, oh, that's going to be hard. <laughs> because I was hoping that it would be done, you know, get it finished. But if, if the house is going to do it in stages, then it's going to be very hard. But he said, that's the only thing I can do. So I, I called him a couple of weeks ago and I, I said, I know what you said to me the last time, but uh, this is going to be a long, long time. And uh, he has not gotten back to me. But he's a, as big as a good man. I, he's an old friend of mine. But you know, but I think, Basically, I guess what I'm saying is this. Number one, the system is broken because it breaks up families and, and makes and, and criminalizes people. And number two, it will not be a problem economically to the budgetary system of our country. And number three, it will help us to find the unity again that prevents us from having two Americas, uh, which we had before the Civil War, uh, which we've had uh, before the Civil Rights Movement, which we've had in so many times. And it's important that we be one America, and one people under God. And that's what the bishops are hoping for. So uh, I know uh, it's almost three o'clock now. You know, everybody looks at their watch. Did he talk that long? Uh, but uh, I, I'm going to, so I'm going to ask the questions, easy questions, so I know you're, you're going to right uh, At 83, I'm not good for it, it's a hard question, so uh, the Father is going to take, because Father is bigger than I am, and if you attack me, he will support me, I think. <laughs> because the, the only other thing is, if St. Francis's wolf is around, i got to make sure it's on my side. And he, he, he gets along very well with Father Mark, so Father, go ahead. So we've got, uh, thanks to Trevor Thompson, our Director of Peace and Justice, for really putting this uh, afternoon together. He's got a microphone uh, that he'll come around so that uh, Jason on this end has one. 
So any questions that you'd like to ask uh, from the crowd? Okay, right oh, here in front. For a moment I thought you were all sound asleep. <laughs> I don't think they are endorsing any real legislation right now. They're endorsing a concept, they're endorsing the need to, uh, to, to revise, to get rid of a system which is broken. But uh, I, I am not aware of any specific thing that the bishop saying, this is the one we think is going to do it. Because I think none of it is going to be perfect. It's not going to be perfect. As a matter of fact, I, not only have I not seen any perfect legislation coming from this Congress or the past Congress at all, I certainly don't expect something on this issue to be perfect. So uh, I think they, they will, I think what they will do uh, is say, uh, okay, this you can support. But they're not going to say, this is the one that's going to be, they'll say, this one, there are enough reasons for us to, uh, to say that this could be helpful, something like that. I think that's the best way to do. And I think it's good that you, we do just that, and not something more, because you know, nothing is perfect. And uh, if we begin to, uh, to push something on our people that isn't perfect, then our people have the right to say, what kind of teachers are you? But if we do say to our people, look, this is something in some way we have to do, then I think we're doing what God wants us to do to help our people. Thank you. can't answer that because I'm not sure what's going on in every state of the union, obviously. I do know that there was a strong reaction to some of the elements in the Arizona legislation. Uh, and I, I, I think the bishops there took a very strong stand saying, this is not, this is not good, this is harmful, uh, and, uh, and, and have been very strong against that. Uh, but I, and I don't know of any other state uh, that, that had gone that far in, uh, in legislation. I really can't talk to that because you know, we got 50 of those states and uh, I'm not sure what each one of them is doing. Yeah. Thank you. Knowing that this bill will not be perfect, but they pass this year, hopefully, um, the bishops have discussed how they're going to address the bar communities with things that are suboptimal in some areas versus others. What messaging are you going to move forward with? Uh, when, when someone says the bishops, they're only talking to one of them, and I'm old. <laughs> and I, I, don't, I don't have a vote in a lot of things because I, when you retire, you're no longer a member. So I can't speak for the conference. But I think uh, if they come up with something which we think is livable, we will say it. You know, we'll, we'll say this is a, this is a livable thing. We can, we, can, we can live with this, and this will be helpful. Uh, uh, if, if, you know, it, you, you always want to get the whole cake, but if you get half a cake, at least it keeps you alive for a while. And I think that in today's complex world, especially in today's complex Congress of the United States, both houses, uh, I think if, if we get something that is that we can live with, uh, we'll we'll probably rush to accept it, because if if we can't get something we can live with then it, that means we won't get anything at all. And it's better to have, I think, a half a loaf. As long as that loaf, that half a loaf, is not going to hurt people. I think that the bishops' conferences are wonderful. They have come out with 
some fabulous documents that we the people in the pews never hear preached. How can we encourage our bishops to be more vocal? Well, I think Father Mark is sitting down and he's drifting off a bit, so I, he, won't, he won't hear what I'm saying, but the real problem is not with the bishops, it's with the masters. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I think very often the pastor says, it's more important to, to talk about the collection than to talk about human rights and stuff like that. Uh, now, that's, uh, that's something I shouldn't say and, and wouldn't say. Uh, in public, but we're family here, so I could say it here. But uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, the bishop's statements sometimes are beautiful and sometimes are very verbose. And people just don't like to read 16 pages of anything. They don't, that's why people aren't reading the newspapers anymore. People are using the, the IT instruments and getting the news out of there. Uh, but I, I really think that uh, uh, the bishops have tried to, to be on this, and as you say, many of the things that they've done are, are, are first rate. I think we have to remind the bishops that people aren't going to read long documents and aren't going to read complicated documents. And if we send out documents that are neither too long or too complex and hit the mark, people will read them. and and parishes will reproduce them and give them out after, after mass. But I think that's, that's, that's important. You put, you put your finger on a very important thing. We, we can preach till the, till the cows come home, but if we're not preaching something that the people will understand, then it doesn't do us any good at all. So I think this is, this is a, a pastoral problem we have in the United States. And I think, uh, I, I think we have to do two things. In the, in, in our bishops have to do two things. Number one, they should preach clearly. Number two, they should preach concisely. And number three, they should preach what the people need to hear, not what they think the people need to hear. And that's, that last is hard to do, but anyway. But see, you're right. Isn't she, Father Mark? I don't think she's a Christian or here, though, are you? <laughs> don't, 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 you, you don't, you don't have to answer that question. <laughs> one of the, our wonderful visitors. We're happy to have you here. <laughs> I wondered, everyone was so quiet on that side, I thought they were all sleeping. I think, first of all, is uh, the unity of families. I think that's, that's key. And when you break up a family, I think that's, that's sort of, that's, that's never good. I think that's something we, somehow the legislation has to, has to touch that and do something about that. Uh, secondly, uh, I think most of the bishops would like to see a pathway to, to citizenship. Uh, because otherwise you end up having, as I said earlier, a, a two-level society. Uh, and, and thirdly, uh, I think the, uh, the bishops would, would want to be sure that, uh, that we would, uh, that, that we, would, we would strive to do this quickly and, uh, and strive to do it uh, without letting other interests uh, affect, uh, affect what, we, what we're trying to do. Uh, you almost can't answer that because you, you, you almost have to have the legislation in front of you and say, okay, this is important, this is important, this is not important, this is important, this is not important. Uh, and, and since we don't have that, it, it, it's hard to, to tell it. But, but I, think, I think it would be very important as we get closer to having something that the bishops be very clear in saying, okay, we want to help you on this, we want to get our people to help, our people on, a, on our side on this. 
And these are the things that we think are the most important. I think the ones I mentioned were, were some of those, but there may be others too. So I, I wouldn't want to try to give you a more detailed answer. But I think that's a very, very important question. Thank you for asking it. preface your question, uh, is it, and mention all those things, and I'm afraid the answer is yes. They're all important. They're all important. I don't think we've discovered the way to get the, uh, the, our elected officials to move. I think we probably have to do all those things. We have to get to them now. Some of them you get to by emails, others you get to by writing, others you get to by petitions, others you get to by making statements, by getting together groups that make statements, others you get to by, by using Knights of Columbus or Daughters of Isabella or some of the, the agencies and, and institutions already around. Uh, I think all of that is, is, is important. Uh, and, you know, sometimes you have some professors who are uh, who are very anxious, some, not professors, some congressmen, who are anxious to listen to what the church, what the people of the church want, and who have turned off the bishops. They don't care what the bishops are saying, because they think the bishops are not talking for the people. Some of the legislators, I know that's true. They say, well, you're saying this, but what do your people really feel? So it's important that the bishops get in touch with their people. That's, that's key everywhere. And none of these people are from this diocese, so to keep on that same level you said before. But, uh, but I, think, and I, I think also we, we might want to, in, in parishes that have social action, justice and peace groups, uh, I think we might want them to answer your question or try to, to take the question and try to begin to answer it. Because I, I think that maybe if each parish would develop something where you have this parish has so many people uh, you could turn an election here uh, not a national election but you could turn an election in the state here uh, and I, I think they will they will listen if a, if a parish gets together and i think that's why we have a justice and peace group to to be to enter into advocacy and i just have one thing where i totally disagree with you uh, where you said that that you were a voter you're much too young to be a voter. <laughs> so, in view of what you just said, why could we not then the bishops and the laity together present to Congress? Why could we not tie in with our thoughts, with your thoughts, and it might be thousands, thousands, maybe even more than that, of names, signatures, that the bishops could say, this is not just us talking, this is, this is our people. Oh. Just a thought. But no, it's, it's a good thought, and, and a thought that has, been, that has been thought already. And the thought basically is saying, uh, yes, uh, the bishops by themselves, nobody listens to them anymore. 
that's not totally true. I think you know, in some places, like here, you would, because you're very nice people. But uh, not that people who don't are not very nice people. I don't get in trouble anyway. <laughs> I'm retired. I can't afford to make enemies. Uh, but I, I think the, the, the manner in which you do this is going to be different in every diocese. You know, in a diocese that has, say, Los Angeles has four, four million Catholics, you know, how do you get everybody to sign something? It's very hard for that archbishop to do something. In a smaller diocese, it is possible. So, but I think that is a methodology that the bishop should be reminded of constantly. You know, not to do something by yourself, to do something with your people. And if your people aren't with you, then you have to start, you know, educating them and, and uh, trying to see why they are not to talk to them and to, to, to bring them, we, we all together. Mm -hmm. um, Father, thank you for um, your insight into negotiating in D.C. Um, very impressive. Um, a question or a thought came from corporate America. We spent a lot of time getting our senior people to mentor junior people. And I'm wondering if you possibly do that for some of the more junior bishops that might be, you know, they have the education of, of ministry and the gospel, but negotiating in the different legislatures might need a kind of man like yours to help people negotiate across lines. You're very kind to say that. I think many of the younger bishops think I'm just an old fogey who doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> uh, but. Uh, but I just happen to be a Franciscan, so that's why I get invited to good places like this. <laughs> but just to, to finish that, yes, they, you know, certainly there are, there are some bishops who would, would say, what do you think to me? Uh, and a lot of bishops would say, don't bother me. Uh, you know, I think bishops are very independent people. Uh, and maybe that's a great blessing uh, because they're representing a lot of independent people. Uh, I think the most important thing is the bishops listen to their people, that they talk to their people, that they listen to their people, that they love their people, that they serve their people. And I think we're so blessed in the United States. We've had so many wonderful bishops who do that. We have to pray that that continues. Uh, and, uh, and that the the young bishops find people who, uh, let me say this now, that I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm going off the limit now, but I, I do it because I think it's important. It's important that, okay, a story. The year is 1995, October 4th, Feast of St. Francis. Uh, the Holy Father, Blessed John Paul II was coming to New Jersey, coming to Newark. He uh, lands in, after a seven hour journey from Rome, he's tired, but he uh, gets off the plane. Uh, Clinton is there to greet him, speaks well. Holy Father speaks well. He gets into limousine. I was Archbishop of Newark at the time, so I got to, into the same limousine. The Pope and I, and uh, at that time, Bishop Jivich, his secretary. And I said to myself, wow, I'm going to have a half hour just to talk to the Holy Father. Look all the things I can ask for. He fell sound asleep. <laughs> About 20 minutes later, I was going to show him all the things passing by, the Newark and everything. I didn't have a chance to talk about anything. So I just sat. I may have fallen asleep too at the end of the day. We got to, to the, my residence. Holy Father got out, a little refreshed, but still very tired. Went up the stairs, and uh, there were like 20 Newark uh, detectives, police, Essex County police, ready to greet him. So we greeted every one of them. Then Jerry said to me, he should change his cassock because he's been, he's on the plane all this time. He, 
give him a chance to wash up. So we brought him upstairs to a big guest room. We all went downstairs. And then maybe 20 minutes later, Jibish came down and he said, won't the Holy Father do anything? And I said, yes, we're going to have a new, this new office building next door. If he blessed the cornerstone. So he said, okay, so we brought the cornerstone up and he blessed it. He came down. Meanwhile, Clinton had come from the airport to my house to meet with the Holy Father. Before that, we had to we had to figure out where they would sit so that nobody on a rooftop could shoot. Uh, so I said, "Well, why don't we just close the blinds, and then they won't be able." So they decided to do that. And the Holy Father went in, and Clinton went in. They spoke for an hour without translators. So the Holy Father had to listen and respond in English, which is not, not always easy. Uh, and uh, at the end of that, uh, the, the, uh, the president had members of his cabinet and members of his of the staff of the White House. He wanted to be able to greet the president. So I know the long line of about 50 people, hello, and this is so-and-so, and response. And the Holy Father was getting tired and tired again. I wondered how he made out with the conversation for an hour whether he fell asleep on the president, and then the president fell asleep on him. And, and only my knocking on the door brought them back. Not God only knows that. Then he went into the, uh, he went into the Pope Mobile and just went around the block to the other side to where the cathedral, to the main door of the cathedral in Newark, those of you who are New Jersey people. And he waited, he stood out, he got out of the limits, out of the, the Pope Mobile, and he, uh, they were going to put an alb on him and a mitre on him. And he saw me and I was going, I gave him that face that we all know how to give people. And uh, he looked and he thought for a minute. He saw that I was right. And my, think, my thinking was, any bishop can walk down the aisle of the cathedral with a mitre and a cope and everything like that. But only one man can walk down in a plain white cassock, and that was him. And he could read my mind. And he said, no, I go this way. So uh, he went in and he stood at the, at the people all shouting, Viva el Papa. He was an extraordinary man. John Paul II was an extraordinary man. He's just a, a very, very powerful and uh, very strong and very loving. And he stood there and he looked at the cathedral. And he knew, because he had been briefed ahead of time, that he was going to go down this aisle, preside over evening prayer, and then go out the back way uh, into the sacristy and then uh, get ready. And he was going to fly uh, to the, pa the, uh, the papal nuncio's residence, the United Nations papal nuncio on 72nd Street. So he realized that what he usually likes to do is go down one side and come back the other so he can greet people on both sides. But he saw that that was not going to be possible and he looked and he, he, uh, he waited for a moment. I could see him figuring out, okay, what am I going to do? JP too was a great grunter and you had to read his grunt. If you could read his grunt, you could make out very well. And, uh, so he, he stood there, and finally he realized what he was, so he went here, and, mmm. and then I said, okay, fellas, we're going to move now. And uh, he started down the aisle, put his arms out, and his legs were not that good. His knees were bothering him. My knees are bothering me, too. That's why once in a while I grab onto father. But uh, his, uh, his knees were bothering him, so he went out like this, and everybody grabbed him, one side and the other side, people from both sides rushing in, nuns, uh, 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 contemplative nuns, climbing up on, on, the, on the benches <laughs> and reaching over just to touch him. And he went, he walked down this way. It must have been very difficult because it was a long, long cathedral. And I watched that. And it, it was something for me that I'll never forget. And, uh, and this is why I, I don't have the influence that I had at one time, maybe. Oh, first of all, because I'm old, and secondly, because I'm stupid. 
but, uh, but, but I think because I've, I've always tried to do this, as he walked down the aisle this way, and it was wonderful because everybody had a chance, everybody had a chance. And he, he went, when he got to the altar, he put his hands down, and then he went up the altar. And I realized, I, I said, thank you, Lord. You're telling me, you give me a lesson. And the lesson is, you gotta stay in the middle. If you go too far to the right, you're gonna lose the left. Go far to the left, you're gonna lose the right. You gotta stay balanced in the middle, balanced in the middle. And that's, I have tried to do that all my life. And I was underlined in that by watching him. For me, maybe I'm the only one who thought that, but for me, it was an extraordinary lesson. Stay in the middle. You know, stay that you can talk to both sides. Because that's why when that lady said, you Republican and Democrat, I said, I'm both. You've got to be both. You've got to have the, the good things of one party and the good things, but you've got to have them both. You know? And you've got to make sure that you're touching everybody and everybody touch you. But that weakens you. See, you have much more authority with the right if you stay on the right. Much more authority with the left if you stay on the left. But the more you try to be in the middle, the more they say, well, we don't know what he's gonna say. But I'd rather they said that about me than that they would say, the people on the right he can't talk to, the people on the left he can't talk to. And I think we're gonna find the same in Pope Francis. And, and that's gonna be a blessing. But what you say is, is very, very important. Absolutely. Any group that any group that we could consider uh, that that some people consider less than others should be considered there. But uh, you know, I I think some of us were very much involved in the civil rights movement. I was at this uh, this celebration was it two days ago, at the march in Washington. I was there. I was there. I I marched. I, I walked with Martin Luther King and carried a placard. And, uh, so. Uh, but so I didn't, I didn't mention that because that goes without saying, you know. If we still have to say that, it means that we haven't reached it. And we haven't reached it perfectly. I'm the first one to admit that. I know that. But I, I think, you know, I, hopefully here in this, in a house like this, you know, we, we've, uh, we, we've overcome some of the stupidity and the sinfulness of the past. But thank you for bringing it up to making sure. I see one arm. This question may um, spread a little from immigration, so if you want to, to decline to answer it, that's, that's fine. But um, I was impressed with um, how pragmatic the approach seems to be on immigration. That, okay, the bill's not perfect, but you know we can support it. So I'm curious if I think about the, okay, I support immigration reform and also health care reform, but it seems to me that the, um, there's not that pragmatic approach to health care reform. Um, basically, what I gather is that the, um, the bishops, the Catholic Church, whatever, they're, they're very angry about some of the, the provisions of Obamacare, and um, they're trying to get it struck down. Well, why the difference in, in the treatment of immigration versus the treatment of health care? And that's, that's not really an immigration question, is it? But um, that's my question. 
<laughs> no, and it's a very good question. It's not the question for this afternoon because uh, this is a very complex issue. Uh, the, the, some people feel health care is a dis the Obamacare is a disaster. Uh, again, you know, I, I think we, we were on the, the horns of a, of a dilemma. Uh, on the one hand, we've got 30 million people without health care, and that scares us because that, you know, all these people don't have health care, all the poor don't have health care. So we wanted, I think the bishops all wanted to have health care. That was, that was going to really touch a lot of the poor people of our country. When the program came out, as it did, it was very complicated. Uh, I don't know of anybody on the hill or off the hill who has read the whole thing. And, and that's sort of horrible because you're talking about a trillion dollar thing and nobody has read it all. The bishops haven't read it all. I haven't read it all. Maybe most of you haven't read it all. And so we've taken positions without really reading it all. And that's unfortunate. Uh, I think, though, you will find, even among the bishops, those who say, the accommodations that the president had made are enough for us to go along. Others will say, no, it is still impossible. Uh, and so, and I don't know how many are on which, which side. Uh, and, and I don't know the answer to that. I, I'm not prepared at this time to, to speak to that. Uh, I, I do know this, that uh, when the uh, HHS definition of religion came out, saying it has to have three things. Number one, a, a stable uh, uh, a presentation of doctrine, which we have. Number two, that you only hire people from your own religious community, which would be very, very difficult for us. And number three, that you only serve people from your own religious community, which would be impossible for us. So that that was, that there, I think, I hope we were all united. You, you can't, you, we could not accept that. We could not accept that. We had to fight for, against that because that's against, it's against the gospel. And I had, there were my great moments, even as an old gentleman, uh, was one of my great moments. I, uh, I was coming out of the State Department, I was mad at something because <laughs> I, I was trying to get them to do something with regard to the Holy Land and they weren't, they weren't wanting to do it. So I was annoyed when I came out. I think the guy saw that in my face. He's, oh, he said, Cardinal. He said, you want to, how about, you want to talk about the meeting you had upstairs? So I said, sure. And uh, he got the thing out and got the machine, it was live. And uh, he said, uh, Your Eminence, uh, I want to ask you about the HHS definition. Right out of clue to this guy. He, he japped me. He, we never had that. He, he gave me a, a, story, a question that he wasn't going to ask me. He said he was going to ask me the meeting upstairs. And instead he asked me about this one totally free. But the Lord was good. He gave me a he gave him a sound bite, which was which was sound bit in a lot of um, television places. I said, well, the only thing I can say about that is that for two hundred years we've been saying, are you hungry? Are you sick? Now we're supposed to say, are you Catholic? We can't do that. And that was a so it was great that I had that opportunity to say it because that made that was that's what the whole thing was. We, we, we can't start saying, you know, are you Catholic? If you're Catholic, we're going to feed you. If you're Catholic. We don't do that. We don't do that anywhere in the United States. We do it anywhere in the church. The day we started doing that, the day we were in trouble. But because of that, you know, that, and that, that's gone now. I mean, that's gone now. So that they, they, have, they have made some accommodations. And there are some bishops, I think, who feel that, well, maybe this is enough. But I think we haven't studied, the bishops have not studied enough to know whether these accommodations are enough. Mm -hmm. So this, I don't think there is a, a firm response yet. Uh, but right now I think there are some who feel, well, they've made a lot of accommodations.